start off, I, I, Tom and Jane Welch sent me a letter earlier in the week. They, they weren't here for this uh, for this presentation. They're traveling. But uh, I wanted to uh, pose these three questions to Richard to start the uh, question and answer is off. So I'll read them out loud and get to it. Okay. Um, Use the mic, please. Can you hear it? Okay. The consultants told us prior to the referendum that a multi-story building with a pitched roof similar to the Pearson School building design was the most energy efficient and lowest maintenance building design. They specifically said that a school building with multiple flat roofs was a high maintenance design that should be avoided. And her question is, or their question is, what does the new proposed school design not look like the Pearson School? Um, Another question that they had, um, one of the major just justifications of the new school was the energy savings that would be achieved over the existing Morgan School. Uh, the question, what guarantees do you have that the current proposed school design is the most efficient building design? And then the last question, if in the future more classroom space is needed, how will this be achieved with the current proposal? Can I go backwards with the question? Uh, <clears throat> just to answer the question first about uh, additions to the school. Uh, these are the little classroom blocks. There's the 10 Academy, there's the 11 12 Academy. We will be able to add classrooms at both ends of the building, here and here. So if we were to add one classroom on each side of the car this corridor, there would be four additional classrooms, which would uh, add between 80 and 100 uh, desks to the school. And if we did the same over here, because this is a three-story building, we would add uh, six, six classrooms, three per side. So it is a, that, that would increase the number of classrooms from 32 uh, in general to uh, 42, which is a pretty significant jump. So that is our, our basic strategy by leaving, leaving these ends open for expansion. Uh, the second question related to energy efficiency. Uh, we have to meet codes for energy efficiency. Uh, which currently are very high. Uh, there's a, an organization called ASHRAE, which is the Association of the American Society for Heating, um, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning uh, Engineers. Uh, and they set the standards for, for the national uh, efficiency uh, requirements for buildings. Because this is a public school, we have to uh, do better than, than, that, than those standards by 21%. So the building will be significantly more efficient by that amount at least than uh, a building that is would be built new today. Uh, buildings that are built new today are very efficient. Buildings that, that, that were built when this building was built were not, did not have to be efficient at all. So, we are going to have a much, much more efficient building uh, at the new site than, than you have today. Um, there are many factors, of course, that go into determining what the efficiency of a building can be, and one of those is the, the function of the building. Uh, schools are quite complicated buildings. They have, they have to uh, meet a lot of different criteria that are not all uh, uh, consistent with having the most possible uh, efficiency. Uh, the most efficient building, of course, is a sphere with no openings, and that is just not something that can be accomplished. So what we will be doing is uh, meeting um, the very, very uh, uh, fixed criteria of the state for efficiency and uh, balancing that with uh, the other functional economic criteria that we know we have to meet as well. Uh, now, 
dabbing at the, the roofs of the school. Uh, the, the process that I tried to outline today uh, or tonight uh, is, uh, is a process that we go through on every school design. We don't know what the building will be like until we get there. We try to uh, determine what the building needs to be based on the site, on the program, on, uh, on the communities that we work for. Those factors drive, and of course the, the, the budget, those factors drive the building form. So uh, what we have developed to, to this point and that we're showing you as a, as a pro, as progress drawings is uh, is the outcome of that process. It's, it's, not, it's not intended to look specifically like another building. It is, it is its, its own building, the, the product of its own evolution. Uh, there will, uh, or there are on this building, uh, pitched roofs. We have, we would have seen that in the elevations. Uh, we know that uh, pitched roofs of the kind that we're showing are more expensive than uh, roofs that have lower pitches. And one of the struggles that we'll be having through this process is with the question of how low can the pitches uh, go, uh, or how steep can they be and still be affordable. Uh, that is, a, that is a, at this point, a uh, open issue. Thank you. Are there any other questions tonight? Okay. Phil. Um, yeah, it, it looks like, uh, what, what consideration is Could you repeat the question, please? Um, the question related to uh, lowering the, the grade of the site uh, next to the river to uh, a point that, that may, uh, may not be appropriate. Uh, we, the, the diagram that we have shown you is, is, is very, very um, diagrammatic. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't define uh, the height of the, the lowest floor from uh, River level. However, uh, it is higher than uh, is, is, is required to meet all the flood criteria that, uh, that we are aware of. If we are higher than we, than we need to be to stay dry. Doesn't a multi level building like this present outstanding challenges for ADA? Could you address that issue? Because both from an adult, uh, the auditorium, the gym, as well as the student, aren't there some outstanding uh, access issues? Uh, the building will be fully accessible uh, for, 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 for all and everyone, uh, regardless of uh, disability. It will meet ADA, it will meet all of the handicap accessibility codes of the state. Uh, we have done we've done this before. We know uh, exactly how to uh, solve the problems, the very real problems that you have raised. I'd like to go back to the river question. Uh, you said that it is above flood level. Is there any history, is there any reason anyone suspects that that river would flood at all? Has it, historically, to anyone's knowledge? Yes. And how high has that gone? High enough to flood out Evergreen Trailer Park just north of there. That is just north of there. Yes. It's north of there. Yes. It flooded I have it lived, out. I have lived for 50 years, my father lived in the house halfway between here and there. That house never flooded. There was never any flooding between here in there. If it flooded north of that, that's another question. We, we, we've had conversations with the Richards family who owned the property back into the 40s. South of Evergreen. Right, okay. And that was one of the concerns that we had with placing the building on the other side of the river. Is, is, is 
that is too low, and we had a big concern about flood issues there. But where they're locating the school right now, I'm not sure, folks, do you know that the, above the level of the river, how far is it? Is it around 40 feet? Is that? It's at 43.5 right now. It's the lowest level. Above the river? Well, that's a, above sea level. Above sea level. I don't know what the exact Jerry, level. we're having a real hard time hearing yeah. this conversation. I'm sorry. I'll use the mic. Another question? Yeah. Eric? Yeah, I, I've long been a proponent of two separate gymnasiums. I'm looking at this plan and what we have right now in high school years. We have two separate gymnasiums. Each, each gymnasium has six baskets. That's just a total of 12. This print you have here shows six baskets. So the town loses half. half. Okay, so your question? It has this view of main course is running from left to right. That's the main course in the court in the middle. Yes, it is. Well, yep. when, when a varsity team's practicing, they're going to be practicing on that main court. Well, which means the rest of the court useless for wrestling, cheerleaders, or anything else. Well, when when there's any uh, yeah, in between the, those, there will be two full size courts right. there, Harry. Yes, when they're split in half, the varsity will be practicing on the full court running this way, and which oh, and all the other room is going to be useless. Varsity can't practice there at the same time that varsity is practicing. Cheerleaders no. can't be out there practicing when varsity is practicing. Well, the idea would be to split the court in half for practices. The only times you'd use the, the, the full court would be during games. But Jerry, you know as a, a player yourself, you want to get used to depth perception, you want to practice at the court you're going to be, the baskets you're going to be playing at. You don't want to be practicing at side baskets and playing on a court that's used to, uh, I know, I know, I used to see him, really. Yeah. And you know that for, uh, as a player. I understand. But I the budget say, doesn't allow for it two gymnasiums. Two, it was two separate gyms. Uh, Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm wondering if you, <laughs> if you saw the original preliminary conceptual design that the voters voted on and what you think might have been, I guess, wrong with it, because this is actually a lot different than what we saw. And we all understand that you weren't going to draw that, but that seemed to solve a lot of the issues. And, and this kind of seems like just a puzzle put together. And I guess another piece of my question would be, as an architect who, you know, we didn't, what would you sort of hang your hat on as if you were driving along Killingworth Turnpike? What about the front of that to you as an architect, somebody who drew it and would be proud of it, what gives it character? What part of that front do you think gives it character that would give our town character? Well, to the first question, um, we, we very much admired the, the referendum design when we, when we saw it. As we uh, began to engage with uh, the program and with the building committee and discussions and with the school administration and uh, look at the opportunities uh, on the site to really have the building become a part of the, the landscape as well as an object in, in the landscape. We uh, saw other possibilities and uh, what you see tonight reflects those other possibilities for um, the interior design or the layout of the building from a functional standpoint and also in terms of its engagement with the with its setting. So we think it's a, a, a design that could not have begun really had the referendum design existed, but we built on it. And the, the irony is that we built something that didn't look like the original plan, but actually many of the attributes in the uh, referendum design also uh, operate in, in this design concept. In terms of the way that the building will be uh, experienced from the, from the street, I have two uh, comments. One is that what you're seeing is a progress drawing, and we are evolving the design. It's not the finished design. That's one part. 
But the other is that we we think that the the, the school should not be uh, emblazoned on the on the landscape, but it should have a, a soft relationship with it. And so it's it's not symmetric while it has a center center door, it's it's not symmetrical. The, there's, there's a, the building on to the left of of the entry point is not the same as the building piece on the on the right of the it's they're, they're different. They're more it's more informal concept. I don't want to say it looks like a rural building, but it it, it is intended to reflect the uh, interior life of the school. So it's a gymnasium but it has windows. It uh, the auditorium will have windows. So we want people to be able to look in and to be able and for people to be able to look out and for uh, people to be able to read the different parts of the building. So th th those are the driving ideas. And as we evolve the design, uh, which we certainly will, uh, I hope that we will be able to come back here uh, for a future session and for, for you to feel like we have accomplished uh, not only what we set out to, but accomplished it in such a way that you like it as well. Given that you're saying that the uh, design is in progress and will evolve, um, what's the likelihood that significant sections will change, and particularly that, for instance, the auditorium might get smaller, or that there will be um, other changes that would be a disappointment to different constituents? Well, uh, we believe at the moment that we're on budget, <coughs> and we hope to stay on budget. And if we stay on budget, then the auditorium will remain a 700 seat auditorium, and, the, and the, all the program elements that there is a current plan will continue to be there. Uh, but we we're not we're not at the end of the road yet, but we're very hopeful. Uh, going along with the auditorium, I'm just was wondering about the sound. Struggle with the sound of this auditorium. And uh, besides that, a loading dock. Is it possible to have a loading dock and bring in the piano? Uh, the first question related to the acoustics in the auditorium. And uh, we will be designing with our acoustician uh, the interior of the auditorium so that it uh, is adjustable to meet a, a range of different uh, needs. So, need for, for uh, concert music is not the same as a uh, small recital uh, for speech or for performance. So the, the building, the auditorium will be tunable for those different <coughs> kinds of uh, requirements. Uh, regarding the, uh, the presence of a loading dock, uh, we actually hadn't thought of a loading dock uh, in, in connection with uh, with, with the stage. That's not to say that it couldn't be done. What we do have in the, currently is an apron outside the, uh, the stage, so that the stage would be at ground level, same level the grade, so in, the people would wheel everything in from trucks into the, onto the directly onto the stage. But that, that, is, that is where we are at this point. <laughs> kind of a two-part thing. I noticed you put windows on the, um, what's turning out to be roughly the southwest side of the gymnasium. Um, am I correct there? That'd be towards the front of the building? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, that is, and it has been even with the gym we have now, even with just that one window there, a problem for teams, uh, especially the basketball teams, practicing, et cetera, in there as the sun begins to set, okay, you can't see the hoop, um, and that type of thing. Um, yet you've designed those in basically for beauty of the building, I believe, um, yet as a hindrance to um, our varsity programs that will be practicing in there after school as the sun sets. Um, that's number one part of that. 
And as far as the beauty of the front of the building goes, and I'm going to call on Dennis to help me with this one, um, I think a lot of us that have lived in town for years, our hearts fell in, in love with the initial design where they were incorporating what we call our traditional Morgan School bell into the original design of the building. And I see that's been forgotten. The bell hasn't been forgotten, Mike. We're, we're still in the process of figuring out where that would go. Um, the issue of glare in, um, in a gymnasium space is a very important one. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It is, a, uh, uh, it is something that we will be looking at. We'll be studying the ways of controlling the entry of unwanted solar radiation into the gym. But there's good solar radiation as well, and there's good natural light. Uh, and we want to ensure that, uh, that the light quality in, in the gym is, is good at all times, and that it, that, that it also uses natural light as well. It's free, uh, for one thing, and it also is better, better quality, and uh, it makes better spaces. Uh, we have um, the putting windows in gyms for quite some considerable period of time, and we have done so uh, pretty successfully. Uh, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the question relates to how do you balance the light inside the gym so that you don't create glare. That is, that is a, that's a design issue. Another is the question of control of the uh, solar radiation, at, particularly at times that you describe. So we understand the problem. to be mechanically ventilated for health. 
uh, we, we, uh, we cannot rely on building configuration alone to move the air around. It will, it will, the building will be broken up into parts, and each part will be served with mechanical equipment that will ensure that the uh, levels of fresh air are, are maintained at an appropriate level. Uh, that, that would be the case whatever the uh, configuration of the Solar panels, uh, we've talked about solar panels. Uh, they are a very expensive source of energy, and uh, they become feasible when uh, other entities are out there uh, picking up the tab, essentially. And at this point, we're not, not aware of that other entity. Well, we you had access to the plane field for the kids. I think you had How will you have access for the kids who will practice in the field? They will, they will, they will leave the building and Cross over. over, over. The back, there, there will be. We're, we're projecting a, uh, a pedestrian bridge and a uh, traffic bridge, vehicular bridge. My question is about sustainable design. I know that this building will not apply for LEED certification or cost reason. Decision was made. But also, I believe in the educational sphere, this notion of now being equal to silver lead. Is it true or not? If this is true, how you will account for it? Because this is process through entire design, so I imagine you will be, even without registration, making decision to collect enough of this sustainable, positive design features to collect enough points for lead design. So we can expect that you will be presenting it to committee as design uh, is uh, moving forward. That's my first question. And second question, I had opportunity to read uh, educational space. I remember there was a, a, a request for provision for outdoor education. Not knowing exactly what was meant seems like a very good thing. What your team envision for outdoor education? Uh, there, were, there were two parts to the question, if I can summarize. One is, uh, if we will not be achieving a, uh, a LEED certification or pursuing a LEED certification, will the building nevertheless uh, achieve a comparable standard? And the second question had to do with the use of the, uh, the site for, uh, for outdoor education. The first part of the question, it is part of our design process to to in effect follow the lead process, but it is but it is not being formalised. Uh, we would be able to uh, uh, to do that if if, if it was requested. Uh, second, uh, we're aware of the uh, the descriptions regarding outdoor education uh, in the in the ESPEC that the, that the uh, curriculum. Has, has not been built around it at this point in a way that we can positively respond through design. But this is a, uh, an early point in the design process that we're in at this point. And there are many, there are many aspects of the program that we will be exploring in greater depth as we move through. Yes. Okay, two questions. What is the reason behind the segregation of grades 9 through 10 and 11 through 12, and can you explain how this design will enhance student performance and why? <coughs> Academies comes from our high school of the future study 
and research that we've been doing over the last four or five years with regard to schools within schools concepts and making the smaller communities of learning. Um, so we built that, that was actually part of our conversation with the um, previous design as well. It was set up a little differently, but it was on two halves of the um, of the design with our um, science labs that have kind of at the center point and then working around from those. Um, the, the guarantee at, you know, with any uh, particular facility with regard to uh, will the design in and of itself improve student performance, I'm not going to guarantee that that, that that by itself is going to happen. Um, however, our focus is on creating those smaller, more intimate um, uh, learning communities where teachers are working with similar groups of kids over a two-year period. They get to know the students better. They, they understand their needs and, and uh, work with them in that two-year process. We've um, talked often about the idea of transitioning kids in and the ninth and 10th grade program being focused around really developing and, and solidifying our foundation skills and competencies. And then with the idea that as they go into 11th and 12th grade, they're applying those skills and competencies to elective courses and to um, areas more of their interest and passion. So they'll have some pathways that they will be following. So inherent in that design, kids are coming in, we're building those foundational skills. As they are moving through 11th and 12th grade, they are applying those to areas of interest as they are pursuing um, uh, college and tech schools and um, life beyond high school. Does that answer your question? Yes. I'm sorry. I think so. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong person the whole time. That's okay. Yeah, I okay. Think, I think so. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Question for the architect. Uh, before you were involved in this project, uh, my mem if my memory serves me correctly, there was a lot of discussion about building the school up and reducing the footprint. And it seems like we've kind of ended up with the reverse of that. And what particularly caught my attention was when somebody asked you about expansion, you said you would go out rather than up. And I guess my question is, why aren't we going up to not expand the, the footprint any further, if that's an advantage? showing here is not um, perhaps quite quite as compact as the earlier design, um, but it is more efficient, we think, um, and it is a design that um, we think gives us more options in terms of uh, managing the cost of the project. Uh, I'm not saying that it's going to be less expensive, but it so it gives us more options uh, as we move forward in our, in our view. Uh, the part about, about additions that you add into the building by building up, uh, if the um, school is designed to accommodate the additional load of a further floor, it may require that we spend more money the structure of the lower floors in order to enable that to happen. Now, uh, it may not be a, uh, a cost that is significant, but it adds yet a further unknown, and it, and it just creates a built-in cost that we may not be able to uh, encompass. So from our, from our perspective, as designers, it is the more expeditious approach to um, know that you can build an addition somewhere, but know that you will pay for it in its totality at the time that you need it. So that's the thing. I guess all I would ask would be you consider going up uh, if that's needed. I mean, that's all. We did, and actually when we got the construction manager on board, Bill from FIP, he looked at some cost estimates going up and it's much, much more expensive to, to put that into the project right now for something that you might not need in the future. So the space has been left on either side of those so that classrooms could be added. Yes? Is this design already expanded to the Already? 
Yes, Would you repeat the question, please? Does the design leave wiggle room? I take it you mean. <laughs> I take it you mean this area here and here, and the answer is yes. That's that's that wiggle room is there. And I, I also another question is: Is there room for more children in the existing facility? Yes, yes, we believe that there is. How much of the school will be cool? How much will be air conditioned for purposes of that? Uh, secondary question is where are, I notice in the academies, where are the vocational education aspect of the school would be? Maybe you could explain that. And last point, I'll shut up. Um, geothermal, have you thought about it? Uh, we're currently projecting that the building will be air conditioned. Uh, we, um, we're showing the uh, Vocational education will be uh, on, the, on this lower level. Oh, oops. Uh, in what we, what we, oh, I'm sorry. Try again. Uh, in this area, which we're calling the elective programs area, that is where vocational education will be. Uh, geotechnical, the geothermal. We have discussed geothermal. Um, it, it is an option, and uh, we are um, at a point where it's, it's it's appearing to be less feasible, but it's not off the table. We can talk more about that. We can talk about earlier. Gas prices are too low. It's the problem. Yeah. Today, Does this site include the property at 69? That's the house that's kind of in the middle of the property. It, yes, it, it does include it. Yes. No more questions here. One more question. Uh, you talk about connecting this up with the Peters complex. And according to that map you had before, the only place that these two properties are shut behind you. The, uh,
I do feel as though I need to reiterate my concern with the matching roof lines, which has been a concern with the old building, and I, I'm so concerned that I'm seeing the same thing again here, and I just want to talk or hear about how are these matching roof lines different from the old Morty building, and that's my, my first question. My second question is, what research are you basing your design on with regards to learning spaces? And I know that you have a reputation for building some schools in New Haven. If you wouldn't mind sharing what those schools are and um, if it would be possible to, you know, have, I don't know if the building committee has already had conversations with those buildings, but to discuss the functionality of the space, maybe if the buildings have been in existence for a number of years now, um, to kind of talk about integrity of the building and whether or not it is a usable educational space. Sorry, loaded question. <laughs> well, the program for this uh, new school is very much driven by um, the, the thinking of the uh, school administrators, the superintendent and the principal, the assistant principal, in terms of their um, uh, their vision for what the school would be, and it. Um, is the uh, direction that we're taking that's followed a number of years of um, discussion uh, in Clinton about what, this, what the schools should be. However, um, the basic principles, as we understand them, have a great deal to do with um, uh, multidisciplinary teaching and uh, collaborative modes of teaching. So the spaces that we're developing uh, reflect that, uh, that that larger uh, concept of pedagogy. As, as it relates to the, the design, we are no less mindful that um, over time uh, things change in, in schools and uh, what was thought to be uh, the way to go it turns out to uh, not be the way to go and people different generations come in with different ideas. So the, the, the design that we are, are moving forward with, and really this is very, comes very much from the um, uh, superintendent as well, is that the, the, the basic uh, design should be very, very simple. So we're, it's, it's, a, it's a design that's, with simple rooms, with, uh, with spaces that can be open or closed, that can uh, grow larger or grow smaller over time as, um, as curricular change, as the needs of the students and of the teachers change. So it's predicated on that idea, not on, a, on one fixed idea of what a school should be, but rather on the history of what schools have been for very many years. Um, so that's, that, that, those are the uh, ideas fundamentally behind this thing. Experience that we've had in New Haven. Uh, we designed the uh, Nathan Hale School, uh, Troop School, uh, Conti School. We're finishing up construction with a new school in East Rock, which is a neighborhood of New Haven. I think that's in New Haven. In the roof line? Oh, the roofs. Yeah, the roofs.
concern you and frankly would concern us as well. Yes? Yeah, Jordan, with regard to the heating and air conditioning, are we zoned? Are we putting different zones in, for example, in the summer? The whole complex is closed except for the administration. Are we being able to zone them off for different areas so that we're not heating them or air conditioning them? Uh, yes, the, the building is zoned. And we went over and we discussed with both construction managers and architects 
as to why that design that we looked at earlier um, was, would have some issues. So um, we are with this design now. now well, tell me, tell me what this is going. To, what what character is that structure that we saw going to bring to the town? I mean, this is similar to what Fabric was saying. That you know, that first building with the tobacco barn aspect and the sloped roofs and the green and the brick and the smoke glass. It, it you know, it it captured your attention. But I'm just not feeling that with this building. Okay, I I understand your concern, and, and, that, and, and we. There's, there's work that has to be done, Carol, okay? And I think you'll notice some changes in the future. Okay. All right. I think part of what might help with that confusion is answering um, the architect's, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't here at the beginning, so I don't know your name, but when um, you said that the uh, structure that was put forth before the referendum, why that was inefficient compared to what you have designed, and maybe if you answered where it was inefficient, might help us understand why this design is better and more efficient. Well, it was slightly less efficient, and one of the reasons that it was is that it had a lot of large uh, areas with single loaded cargoes, and uh, those are inherently less efficient than the the scheme where the car was pulled, uh, pulled together in a way so that one, one length of car will serve two classrooms in, instead of one. One of the effects in terms of efficiency is not just the footprint, but it is uh, the length of time that it takes to get from one place to another. And uh, where there are single loaded corridors, that length can that, Travel distance can be can be longer, and the efficiency also relates to how the how the building is organized. Where we can organize into uh, very clear academies, and they're up, and they're um, organized into uh, compact clumps of classrooms. The overall uh, passing time in between classes, for example, can be much uh, much quicker than where uh, classrooms are more dispersed in, in, in the building. Will you show the front of the girls that came in late? Well, I, 
idea of looking at the programmatic elements of the uh, um, split, if you will, between the, uh, the integrated academies really looks at what courses would be, uh, what science courses, what courses in general would be taken by juniors and seniors versus freshmen and sophomores. And so uh, generally what we have seen is that, or how we have set this up, is that your two full, full, fully developed um, chemistry uh, science labs would be together um, in the 11th and 12th grade academy. And your natural science labs would be in the 9th and 10th grade. So your integrated science and, and biology type labs. And so we've really done a lot of work with the architects and, and really with the, um, the high school administration and the science department in terms of looking at what kinds of lab space we really have, we absolutely need to have and how best to um, work with the programmatic design of that, uh, those elements. So we are, in, in effect, creating some economies of scale with the storage areas between those science labs, um, the prep space between the science labs, um, by, and by creating two, if you will, natural science and then the, the chem labs or the um, chem and physics labs. So you would have your sophomores taking the regular biology, and then your seniors possibly juniors, but mostly seniors, taking AP biology, going back into the ninth and tenth grade way. We have, um, we have the way that the idea of the science, we still have six science labs built in, but there are going to be the two uh, primary chem labs, and then there will be um, science spaces, science lab rooms that are adaptable for, for those purposes. So that we will still have the ability to have that flexibility. So they won't be going back, if you will, into the, the ninth and tenth grade. I, I just have to apologize. I, I just want to make mention, I forgot um, to mention two other building committers, committee members that are very important, and I didn't mention them earlier, but Peggy Sullivan joined the committee, and she, she's an architect in, in, um, in uh, Chester, and, and she's done a wonderful job helping us out. And, and of course, John Giannotti has been tremendous. Um, his knowledge of the building trade has helped enormously, so I'm sorry for not mentioning them earlier. Um, we're just going to take a few more questions, so um, either one of you. Well, uh, last week when I videoed this, there's just I actually have one question for the architects and a number of questions for the school building committee. And the, but last week when I videoed this, it seemed that, that that outline that you had for the wetlands was the outline for the wetlands. And I, you talked about it being the setback. Is that is that the setback, or is it the or is it the wetlands itself, uh, that 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 border that you showed? For the wetlands. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. I do have some questions to the Morgan Building Committee. Okay. Uh, what is what are, what is is your plan for the disposition of the home that's currently at 69 Killingworth Turnpike? What will happen to that to that building? That's a good question. We 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 had talked about it previous to this, and but we. Quite frankly, we haven't had any further discussions. Um, we should be able to purchase that property within the next few weeks. There's a meeting tomorrow night to uh, formally approve purchasing it. Um, it's not in the plans, so we have to have a discussion really as to what to do with that building. One of the options would be just to demolish it. Another option would be to move the historic part of the building to another piece of the property. Another option would be to have someone dismantle the building and put it somewhere else. Do you have any idea what the cost of moving would be? Do you have any? No, we don't. Okay, then another one that I have is um, on the reporting, on the financial reporting, there's, there are no uh, encumbered amounts. I know you've got $1.7 million for the architect, which would appear there. Uh, I don't know whether you consider the $350,000 for the, for the property encumbered yet or not. I understand you talked about FIP as a... Has a contract been signed with FIP? And if, if so, how much is that contract? Um, the contract hasn't been signed with FIP. It's in negotiations right now. Um, we have to meet with them pretty soon, so I'll be talking to my members. We've talked to, we've given them a copy of the contract. They've looked at it, asked for some changes. We've looked at it now, and we have another meeting planned. Um, 
not sure exactly. I, I think in our budget we had somewhere in the neighborhood of two million dollars. Is that right? I'm asking what your current commitment, actual commitments are at this point. So there's Thank no. You. You don't have a, a commitment in terms of a contract yet with FIP. Is there anybody else? We have to sign the contract with FIP. I do you have with hope any? To do so within the next week or two. Right. Are there any others that you've signed contracts with that you have commitments for, besides the architect and possibly the sales contract for the property at 69 Killingworth Turnpike and the site? Not that I know of. Okay. Now the site they already purchased. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Jerry, um, in one of our prior meetings. Uh, we talked about the district-wide facilities maintenance portion of this building where all the supplies are stored, all the operation equipment is stored, etc., for the entire school district. It was not incorporated into any prior plans. Um, it doesn't appear that it's included anywhere in this. Um, and there was a comment, according to my old notes, it's something we have to look at. We may have to build another facility someplace else in order to accommodate it, so on and so forth. Um, I want to ask about that, number one. Right. And number I won't remember the second question, okay. so I'll answer that one first. <laughs> we passed the buck on that one, too. And, and right now, it sits in the hands of the Municipal Building Committee. And the reason why we, we didn't incorporate it into our initial cost estimate for this project was because there were too many variables at that time. We didn't know what size building we needed for that maintenance department. We didn't know where to locate that maintenance department. And there was talk of possibly combining the, the education maintenance department with the town maintenance department. So at, at the point we were in, in our process, we didn't have answers to any of those questions, so we took it out of our budget. Um, right now, Willie can answer this maybe a little better than I can, but it's it's a decision that the municipal building committee has to make, and they're they've been talking to Mike Cozy, our director of maintenance, to determine the size of the building, and then they're also looking at locations um, for that building to be placed. Okay, so you're looking at at that possibly being an entirely separate building from anything to do with this particular project. That's correct. I, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but right now it doesn't look like there's a spot on this property for a maintenance building. Okay, and then my second question, and somebody started to ask about it, and was kind of just glazed across. Um, again, looking at this particular plan, um, in the career and technical education area, it appears that there's been a significant downsizing since the original plan. Um, and I was wondering what the theory was behind that with the new standards that are going to be released shortly. I'm looking for our superintendent. Oh, there you go. I'm going to pass the book on that one. Generally speaking, the, the, the overall space, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, um, is not reduced from a programmatic standpoint. We're still um, we'll be offering. The, the one thing that we're really working with is the shift from um, a, a, a fully um, <coughs> uh, operational automotive lab to more of an engineering and design concept in that uh, STEM that we've been working on since for four years, um, really in terms of trying to shift the, the emphasis of um, how we are using design engineering, uh, technology, and mathematics, or science and technology altogether. So the facilities that we have um, are really designed to meet those programmatic needs that we've, that we've established over the course of the last three or four years. So it's not, uh, there may be you know, some uh, reduction in, in total square footage, but not significant compared to what had been originally in the conceptual designs. Why would we do that in light of the fact of the new standards that are going to be released? Why would we downsize when they're looking to do just the opposite? We're not looking to downsize, we're looking to use the space in more efficient and um, STEM-focused ways. And the, the whole idea is to incorporate and to truly create an integrated STEM program as opposed to independent um, uh, uh, compartmentalized programs. So um, we're actually I think we're going to we'll end up as we move forward being ahead of the curve with regard to the the um, the standards per se. Gentlemen, wait back. 
uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's a, um, uh, a designed uh, direction for integrating those those uh, elements of, of education. Yeah, I greatly appreciate the people in our community who brought this idea forward. It's a tremendous vision. I'm troubled by something you just said, Mr. Architect. You said this is the give and take section, and you mentioned such a simple thing as windows. I have great troubles thinking that there shouldn't be windows in that whole thing. In the building, in spaces people use, I have great trouble with this idea that somehow there's these environmentally managed spaces. And I work in the building trades. And the simple concept of the ability to open a window, I would strongly urge at this stage of the game should be greatly considered. We would like that as well. <laughs> yeah, just one more thing. I have a pedestrian question uh, about the water supply to the school. I understand there's water on Oak Ridge. That's where you're going to get it from, public water, city water. Uh, and I know the only other option was to come up Route 81. Uh, I've been educated by one of your members that the cost of coming up Route 81 would be very, very high. However, I couldn't help with think that or remember that one of the main selling points for building a new school was economic development on this site and perhaps other sites in this area. And I can't also help uh, but think that putting public water up this highway would eventually help that happen, would be the first step in, in making that happen. So I, it may be beyond your scope, but I would hope that you know the town would consider that that aspect of it because we need the tax base that that might help to provide in the future. That's all. I think what you're looking at is the cost difference of between $500,000 for bringing it up to 81 to like $100,000 bringing it from Oak Ridge Drive. But there is water here. I mean, that's not just public water here. There is public water to the Morgan School, yes. To this site. Oh, okay. but not any further. Yeah. You, you begin uh, saying that at the end you address the contamination issues, and in July uh, I videoed someone asking you when the um, when the soil test, the, the phase two, would be done, whether it be done before or after purchasing, um, and you said it would be done before. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the property was bought on April 27th, and the report came out uh, on June 29th. I'm um, just wondering how you account for that. And can we get some questions about contamination before the... the Actually, Matt Kennedy is here. Good. And after the meeting, um, anybody can come up and talk to Matt Kennedy with any questions you have about environmental issues. I think it's um, too important to... As far to as the closing, the closing did take place, I'm not sure of the date, April, April, yeah, April the 27th. Okay, so that was before we had the results of the phase two environment. But I think the questions for, about the environment are too important to have them offline. I think those ought to be asked publicly. Um, I was just wondering where the library was. I didn't catch it. Um, the library is what we're calling the uh, learning commons. So he'll, he'll, right. Could you explain that a little bit more? Uh, this is the main... Here's the same drop off the front door, the circulation hub, and this is the learning commons. So it's it's accessible of of this space, it's also accessible adjacent to the 1112 Academy, and here's the 910 Academy. And and the doors of the commons is here. Well, the doors along here and here. So that would have like a computer lab and uh, the, the, the computer lab is here. Uh, then there are going to be uh, booths along this edge for small, small group and uh, uh, collaborative work. <coughs> There's the reading areas of it along the window edge. Uh, this and then the collection itself will be in the same place. Thank you. Okay. 
I'll, I'm going to do one more question and then um, <coughs> conclude the meeting. But I know my building committee will definitely stay around and answer questions, and, and Richard and Brooks will definitely be here, and I, I can certainly answer some questions as well. So with one last question, go ahead. I agree with the earlier comments about the facade not being very attractive from uh, Route 81 and really not having much character and really paling in comparison to the original drawing that we were shown, the original concept. But uh, I have an even bigger problem aesthetically with the rear of the building that's uh, along the river in that it appears like industrial and it, it seems to just have a, a series of, if you go back to the slide I'd appreciate it, but it appears to just have a bunch of simple um, factory type windows and how that blends with the environment I'm not quite sure because it really just looks like an industrial building. feel free to stay. Um, Richard will be glad to talk, Brooks will be glad, and then Matt Kennedy, I'm going to put you on the spot, put your hand up. If you have any questions about in the environmental concerns on the property, please talk to uh, Matt or one of our